With market oversaturation, people are overwhelmed by the vast amount of content available to consume. That's why podcasting is such an essential strategy for business promotion. However, starting your own podcast is no simple feat. You need the right guidance to make sure that your podcast stands out from the rest and puts you on the path towards success. That's where my podcast launch intensive comes in. It provides a 10 week intensive training course with four to five activities for people to complete each week allowing them to overcome the common obstacles for a podcast launch. The main goal of the podcast launch intensive is to help you save on time, effort, and money caused by common do-it-yourself podcast mistakes. It's about making intentional decisions that will help you get started and find success in your podcasting journey. Join the intensive today. Visit dannyosmond.com slash PLI to find out more. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode. This is going to be a really cool interview for you. If you've ever wanted to just find two people who know a lot about podcasting and have been working in podcasts for several years now and just sit around while they hang out and talk about the things that they're seeing in podcasting and how to improve and how to grow audiences and how to get interviewed on other podcasts and how to pitch and all those sorts of things, this is the conversation for you. I welcomed one of my new friends, Angie Trueblood, onto the podcast, and she has a podcast as well. So we just decided to do a discussion and ask each other questions about the things that we know. You know, me, I'm more of a podcast producer. I help people launch their shows, get their shows out each week, and also grow their audiences and build systems around making sure that their podcasts grow their business and things like that. Angie is more of an expert at podcast PR, so how to pitch yourself as a guest to be on podcasts, how to be a good guest when you go on there, how to get great guests, how to become better at pitching, and 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 all those sorts of things. So if you've ever wanted to have one of those times where you just sat and you listened to people who really knew a lot about this this world and medium of podcasting, this is your chance to do that. Wait, so you don't think there's any, so you don't recommend opt-ins for folks that are guests on shows? Right now, I recommend a, um, and you know, we could, we could talk about this in depth too, because this gets into the nitty gritty of like, where, where we are both experts in this. I tell people to use their podcast to open the relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and for me, the most effective way to open the relationship with a podcast when you're a guest, like yeah. you're on someone else's podcast, you're talking to their audience, their audience trusts them. They don't trust you yet. So asking them to go to your site and put in their email address and download something is a big ask for mm -hmm. a lot of people, right? The, the email address these days is like the physical address, your street address. Hey, give me your home address. Yeah. So what I tell people is while you're having that conversation on the podcast, they've asked you a, a question about something that you're an expert at. Use that as an opportunity to say, and hey, you know, if you want to know more about this topic or I, I, you know, go check out episode 35 of my podcast called this, 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 and this, okay. because in that episode, I go really in depth and then listen to the next episode after that too, because I brought on so-and-so expert to go even further into it. I see that as a better way because mm -hmm. what you're doing is then someone's already on their mobile device. They've got their podcast app open. All they then have to do is search for your podcast, download that episode, or they subscribe even, yeah. and they start to create a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. And then if they're a normal podcast listener, right, they, they listen to episode 35 and then they go back to episode one. And they listen to all your episodes and then yeah. you've got them. And then yeah. they're listening for your opt-ins and your calls to action. Um, and then I tell people like, you know, when, when the host asks that question at the end of every episode, which you and I will probably do to each other, um, you know, where should people go to find you? I just say, have one evergreen thing, 
whether that's your website, whether that's your Instagram, whatever, have them go there because you probably have some calls to action there. It's another chance for them to get to know you yeah. before you ask for the goods, before you ask for the email address, right? Yeah. And it's good. It's good to give people a lead magnet. It's good to do that sort of stuff. But um, I like the relationship in first. Sure. And then, you know, if you want to give the lead magnet for the the person to have in their show notes, and it's just like the download link, and they don't have to give an email address, I think that works even better because then people feel better about the relationship from the beginning. Yeah. You know, they know people are going to ask for email addresses. Yeah. So we have a little of a different approach, but yeah. it is, I like to give options. So, you know, I know there's like two schools of thought on this and we haven't actually tested it because I always recommend giving a couple options yeah. just depending on kind of how deeply the listener falls in love with you. Because if at the end they're like, I love this person. I want to stick with them. I want anything that they have to offer. Then I feel like we should offer them to give us their email address in exchange for something of high value. Mm -hmm. So I'll typically do all of them. So I'll typically offer an opt-in. I'll offer my podcast. For me, that's the one yeah. I know it's optimized. So, you know, we'll we'll meet and exchange email addresses down the road if that's the route they take. And then I should I go to Instagram. Um I am interested though in playing around this year with a different type of opt-in. So, and you probably have experience with the private podcast feeds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am actually thinking of creating probably like a five episode private feed and have that be my opt-in because they would still need to give me their email address. Right. But I feel like the resistance to getting more content in the mm -hmm. same medium that they're already using is going to be much lower. It's lower, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. So Exclusive I kind of want to check that out in some way. Mm -hmm. um, is a great way, uh, and you know, when this is being edited, we can put this whole discussion somewhere. I know. <laughs> can we introduce ourselves? <laughs> we we can. Um, I wanted to. What was I going to say about? Um, yeah, the, the 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 other thing that I've seen working recently is the the after show concept or like the shorter episode, not necessarily private, but the follow up to the interview rather than doing it in the episode with the interview itself. Yeah, is taking you know doing a ten minute episode, a five minute episode later in the week that is just your thoughts. Um, it doubles the downloads. It doubles the the mm. times that people are engaging with you. And I've had several clients now where that uh, that short content actually gets more feedback and more engagement, people asking questions about it. Um, some clients have used that, that episode as a chance to answer questions um, that people have had about the episode earlier in the week. So like, you're, like if, you, if you're a guest on someone else's show, then you... It would be that host yeah. that would offer the additional, right. not, yeah. okay. Or or you could do like, if you're guesting on other shows, you could use a short episode as the opportunity to say, hey, I was on this other um, podcast this week. And these, here are some of my thoughts from being on that interview. It's kind of like, a, just get people into your world more of how mm -hmm. you're thinking and the things you're doing because like it gives that. them a chance to engage, right? It, it makes them feel like they're, more part of your community, part of your show, yeah, um, all sorts of things. But, but yeah, we we probably should like introduce each <laughs> other first. Um, okay. So, Angie, you know, tell me a what do, what do you do here? What is it yeah. you do here? Yeah, what do you do on this? Um, you're you're the host of. Uh, I have a name. My podcast has yeah, a name. Your to podcast it. is Go <laughs> Pitch Yourself, yourself, right? Which yeah. you have a course and all those fun things coming out as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. But tell me, tell me what you're doing now and how you got into this, how you yeah. found yourself into this space. Yeah. So I'm a podcast visibility strategist. I also created that title uh, about three and a half years ago because there weren't a ton of people out in the space pitching clients. But my team and I work with clients and we develop their messaging and then connect to them with relevant podcast hosts um, to really position them as an expert in front of audiences that would welcome their message and their expertise. 
So the business currently has a couple of different sides and offerings. There's a client side where we work one-on-one and kind of like in your production side of your business, right? We yeah. handle all of it for them. And then there's also more of a group program, kind of a DIY arm to the business. I would never call it passive. Um, it's yeah. the go pitch yourself program is the basis of it, where we teach entrepreneurs how to really strategically pitch themselves, right? Because we could all send out a hundred pitches a month and hope something shakes out, but we really do it with the intent to deliver value and ultimately convert those episodes and those listeners. And then I just recently also launched a membership on the back end of that to really give more one-to-one support from people who are still keeping that in-house. And a lot of those folks have a team that are supporting them, but they just need the expert eyes of someone that's done it in sort of mass quantity yeah. before. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, um, it, it was funny how I discovered you because yes. I was, I was working on one of our clients' podcasts, Kate Kordsmeyer's um, Success with Soul. And I heard you talking about this and I was like, okay, this sounds like, so-and-so that I know of or so-and-so that I know of. But as I listened to it more, I was really intrigued that it seemed to be much more hands-on, like you said, not passive, more really helping people understand how a pitch works, why it works, and understanding what they talk about um, and and who they would connect with on a more organic level uh, as a guest on a podcast or as guests for their podcast. Um, And so I thought that was, I thought that was wonderful. Um, Well, I mean, the interesting part about the way that we sort of approach it is that it's good for podcast pitching, but it's mm -hmm. also good for really pitching yourself in almost any capacity, whether it's introducing yourself to someone so you guys can collab or pitching for speaking, right? Mm -hmm. So when you really know what value you bring to the table and who you should be connecting with, then the rest is just, let me teach you how to write an email that gets opened and, you know, that you get responded to. So yeah, yeah, Yeah. thanks for that. Yeah, so I wanted to introduce you to my audience because I always like to bring folks on who have a lot of the guests that we have on host their own shows. Mm -hmm. And so it's an opportunity for my listeners to really hear what are hosts looking for? Like what makes me stand out from the crowd? How can I be a great guest? Right. And since you produce and have such experience in that space, I thought you could offer a lot of just depth of what are the best practices and Mm -hmm. and we'll get into that. But I thought your experience really lended itself to my audience being able to kind of see behind the scenes. So will you kind of introduce yourself to my people? Well, I, I, I hope, I hope I can help. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I actually had this really interesting call uh, a little bit before we got on with one of my longtime friends in the space who also is a podcaster and does a bunch of other things. And she said to me, said, you know, Danny, like the thing I like about you, the thing that's different um, than the rest of the podcast production people out there, the rest of the production gurus out there, whatever, is like, you're really honest and you're really straightforward about what you have to do, what you don't have to do. And she, she said that like, you know, you really focus on telling people what's real about podcasting and that it's it's not this magical thing that is going to turn you into a viral celebrity and it's, <laughs> you're going to blow up and it's going to be amazing. You're, you're really truthful about it's hard work and it takes time and you have to engage with your audience and all this sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, basically what, what we do, and I came at this because I have a production background, is we help the, the busy podcaster, the busy professional, the... Um, the person who knows they want to podcast, but really needs a lot of support. Um, yeah. So they know they have something to say. They can probably figure out how to record their podcast. They can speak into a microphone, but that's where they want to pass it off. These are the mm-hmm. people, they value time, um, maybe more than money, but they value time. They know that they need to outsource things. They know that it will be better if they outsource things. So we spend a lot of our time, uh, half of our time helping people create shows and build them and launch them. Yeah. And then the other half of our time is supporting a lot of those people in their ongoing podcast journey of producing their podcast, but also creating 
um, the marketing and promotion stuff that goes with every podcast episode and all the publishing to all the different places like their website. So not just their RSS feed where the, the episode goes out, but their website and their email list and their social media and creating micro content and repurposing their podcast yeah. into different things. Um, so we spend a lot of time doing that. And like this, this person was telling me earlier today, I've always focused on quality more, um, not on numbers. Like, let's get it out there. Let's get more clients. Let's get this. It's it's helping clients create a quality show and, and being really honest with them. I had a conversation with a client earlier today where I was saying, hey, look, your downloads are starting to tail off. And here's why I think that is. And it's the thing I've been telling you for months about oh, you wow. need to talk to your audience more. You need to ask them questions. You need to bring them on. You need to tell about how you help people and the clients you work with and things like that. Um, so we do a lot of that, but we also do a lot of, if you can create a high quality show that sounds good and has content that really helps people, it is going to build an audience. It's going to build an audience that trusts you, that likes you, that is willing to buy your stuff and, and work with you on things. Um, and they will be a, a loyal audience that you won't see from other things like video and social media and um, blogging. blogging and anything like that. Yeah that they, you will create something where you've got this group of people that are your core. They're your inner sanctum. They are the people that you can build a business on. Yeah. Um, and I've How seen did it. you get into podcasting then? I, I didn't share mine either. I stumbled sure. upon it in a previous business, Yeah. pitched myself, fell in, like recognized them that most people hate doing that. And yeah. I loved it, yeah. but I don't, how did you get into it? Well, I was in the music world. So I'm a classically trained musician. I have a master's degree in music, um, in conducting. I spent a lot of time in the nonprofit arts world and really enjoyed that, but also got frustrated with how long it was going to take for me to really get to the point I wanted to be in my career. Um, and then some life things happened that, that meant that my wife and I needed some more flexibility. One of us was going to need to work from home. Um, uh, specifically the, the birth of my daughter, she has some medical issues. And so I was like, okay, well, I need to do something from home. I need to find a way that I can work from home. What could I do? What do I know? And I knew recording, I had started to play around with it. I played around with it since college. And this is, you know, 10, 15 years later at that point. Um, and so I started recording musicians cause that's what I knew. And some of the frustrations I had in the nonprofit world were carried over because they were actually music things. They were people that didn't think, didn't have a business mind. They weren't entrepreneurial um, with their businesses or projects that would last for years. And I would just get so tired of because it would be like the same thing over and over for two years. Um, people that didn't pay on time, all that sort of stuff. And I realized, okay, there's this podcasting thing and I like podcasts and I listen to podcasts. And some of these podcasts have really changed my life. Like some mm -hmm. of these people have impacted me. There's something powerful there. For sure. But a lot of them were really struggling with their quality of their sound. And I was like, oh, let me help these people. Like, cause this, this would be really easy. Like I, uh, some people I would just email them and say, hey, buy this microphone. Like just buy this microphone. It's, it's inexpensive. Start using this microphone and you'll be better off. And then some people I reached out to and said, Hey, can I, can I help you with your show for free? Because I love it, but it's just, it's unbearable to listen to. Or like, I hear you, you know, pause for six seconds, like, and you didn't edit that out. And, and, or you redid this line and you left it in there and you missed it. And I'm just like, that's kind of embarrassing. And I laugh, but I'm like, so I started helping people for free. And then people started paying me to do it. And, mm -hmm. and then it was so-and-so client said, hey, could you also do this? And hey, could you also? And I was like, oh, sure, I'll figure that out. And okay, well, I, I don't do websites, but let me get a website developer that I could have a relationship with. Nice. And then I'm not a graphic designer. Let me find some people that could do that. Yeah. Or, wow, I can't edit 15 shows a day. Uh, I need to hire some editors. So yeah. let me work with some people and train people that I trust. And and that's where it's gotten to now is, is a, a team of people that can do all the things. And I can 
you know, manage it, manage it from above and, yeah. and work on growing things more. Love it. Well, so I had a question based on the way that you and I met. Well, mm-hmm. and I know that you had a podcast where you talked about podcasts basically as a referral engine. Yeah. And I thought it was very meta that that is like the way that you and I met mm-hmm. the podcast hadn't even gone live. You just kind of heard me as a guest. And I appreciate that you kind of shared just my approach was a bit different than mm-hmm. other people in this space. But from your perspective, being behind the scenes in so many different shows, is that really what makes a guest stand out when they are, you know, because there's business coaches that we pitch, there are parenting specialists, there are sales folks. Like, what is it in your mind so that my listeners can hear? Like, what makes a yeah. guest stand out as someone that you would? reach out to the host and say, Hey, can you connect me with this person? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, it was a no brainer. Cause I was like, wow, that's one element of my business in terms of advising podcasters <laughs> that I, I just don't do. Yeah. Um, like I send out a PDF that says, Hey, this, here's some recommendations. Um, I don't book people. I don't pitch people, all that sort of stuff. So it made sense that I'm like, wow. Okay. I've met some of the people that are, you know, competitors to you. And mm-hmm. I'm like, ah, and, I've, and I've heard good and bad things. So like, I don't recommend certain things. But then hearing how you described what you do, I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I like this approach. So it was easy for me. But I think for a lot of people, when I hear, so let me let me think about the clients I have, because I have a lot of different you know, podcasters in the in the business space, in the coaching space, in the personal branding space, yeah. um, in in the professional space, where like lawyers and doctors. And the thing that it always comes down to is, can the person, first of all, like sound like they know what the heck they're talking about, right? Can yeah. they make, can can they deliver a point in a clear way, without? saying um a million times or like or and and really come across as an authority Mm -hmm. um and then at the same time do they sound good like do they have a good setup where it's not going to be a big pain and i'm gonna (laughs) embarrass myself when i put this on my podcast because all of my other interviews i'm really um intentional about making sure the guest sounds good um that tends to be where it comes down to is can they talk and can they sound, do they sound good? Mm -hmm. Um, And then do they give something to my audience? Do they give some sort of value that relates to the, the journey that my audience is on? Yeah. Um, Because again, you know, I work mostly with clients who have podcasts that are part of their business that are either creating business for them or building a community that they can get business from um, or just as a, you know, a lead gen type thing in some sort of way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's for me, that that's what it comes down to. And it's like you, you specifically, I do this all the time. Like if I hear a guest on a client's show where I'm like, Oh, I totally need to interview that person. Yeah. They, they'd be on my show. Can you introduce me? I do that all the time. Um, just as a, I guess, a smart business practice and creating relationships. But like, I had a client last week who, um, they're, they're also my accountants Mm -hmm. and I do their show and they had a guest on and I heard something with his setup where I reached out to them. I said, Hey, can you send him an email and just say, Hey, change this or try this microphone or whatever. Cause like his show is really great, but I'm noticing that it sounds pretty bad and I heard it on your interview too. And like, let's just help people. Let's make all the podcasts better if we can. Yes. Whether they're a client or not. Well, it's interesting you say that. And I think for your listeners that might be tuning in thinking, okay, well, how can I get a couple of tips to help me like pitch myself and get on other people's shows? Yeah. The first was that you and I are in super complimentary spaces. So Mm -hmm. we basically serve the exact same audience just in different ways. So if your people are thinking, well, I really want to be a guest on shows. That's the first thing to do, right? Is identify who are the types of people that serve my people just in different ways. Because you, you know, if you would have been someone else to where your audience, even if you were representing almost like artists or like just Mm -hmm. creative folks who have more of like an entertainment type podcast, it wouldn't have been a good fit, right? Right. Um, Right. 
And then the sound piece. So something we started doing in our pitches like a year, year and a half ago, and I never did it before. I basically hired someone as a contractor to help pitch. Mm -hmm. And I had her send me a couple of pitches before. Mm -hmm. And she included a link to an audio snippet from previous interviews. And I was like, well, this is genius because, you know, we link to previous interviews, but who knows if the host actually like has time to click on the link and go press play. And so we just pull a less than 60 second audio clip and we create a little graphic and headliner Mm -hmm. and we include it in the pitches so that if the host wants to hear, because that's Mm -hmm. super important as a podcast host, I want to make sure that one, we have the right energy, but two, yeah. that your voice and how you show up is going to be appealing and trustworthy yeah. for my people. Well, and and I know you wanted to ask a little bit about setup and stuff. I mean, that's a really easy thing to do for most people now. Yeah. Um, whether they are going to be uh, a professional guest or whether they're going to have their own podcast, um, it's really easy to go out and buy an Audio Technica ATR twenty one hundred. Um, just not as long mine. As it's working, just not like yours. <laughs> you know, they, they're a pretty sturdy mic, but if you drop them once or twice, or if there's like, I've 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 seen them last a year or two, and then they kind of wear out, um, or the the USB cable wears out, or something like that. Um, or like I did have some people who've they they put the windscreen on and then they put a second windscreen on and then they put a pop filter in front of it because they're so concerned about mic pops and plosives that I'm like, well, that's why your mic sounds a little muffled because you're like choking the mic yeah. itself. Um, the, this, you know, the screen is here to catch some of those things and, and let the sound in. But if you get, you know, an Audio Technica ATR 2100X or Samson has the Q2U or something, it's very similar USB um, Rode has a similar, you know, it's the traditional shaped dynamic microphone, USB. Under $100, you plug it straight into your MacBook Air, your yeah. MacBook Pro, your, you know, ThinkPad, your Chromebook, whatever. It's going to work immediately and you can record, you know, you can record with Zoom, you can record with QuickTime, you can record with GarageBand, you can record with voice recorder that comes on Windows. That's a very basic setup, but it's pretty much free to have the software. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're a great talker, you can just publish that. Like you can send mm-hmm. something to uh, a website like Ophonic, you know, A-U-P-H-O-N-I-C.com okay. where it's AI mastering. You essentially, here's my well-balanced MP3 or it's a relatively good recording level. Um, please make it broadcast standard. And what they do is they'll, it reduces the noise some, it raises it to a certain loudness. So for most people, you could start a podcast that way. But even if you're just professional guest, if you have headphones and that microphone, your quality on Zoom, on Riverside FM, on uh, uh, Squadcast, on Zencaster, on whatever, yeah. is going to be better than a lot of people that yeah. are using if they use earbuds or whatever. So that like, that's the first thing that you want to do. Um, and I say that because that microphone is pretty good in most locations. Yeah. It's, I've heard it sound good in, you know, people that have 20 foot ceilings and wood floors and, you know, big rooms that you think would be really echoey, but because it's a dynamic mic, because it's really only listening to close to it, it sounds better um, than the Blue Yeti, than a lot of other microphones that people use. Oh, okay. So that is a little mind blowing for me for audio Mm -hmm. because I recently had a client who I interviewed for my Mm -hmm. show and I felt like she was super echoey. Yeah. And I didn't even think, so that's great for me to be sharing with folks too. Like you don't actually need a Yeti unless you have a pretty well insulated space. Yes, And that's the thing that a lot of people, and this is where my recording engineering background Mm -hmm. comes in. If you understand the different types of microphones, um, there's there's other types. There's ribbon microphones. There's um, electro uh, electric micro piezoelectric. There's contact micro. There's all sorts of okay. types of microphones. But for people that are speaking into a microphone, basically there's dynamic and condenser. Okay. And a dynamic microphone doesn't require power. 
Um, you can have USB ones. You you know the ATR also has like the traditional microphone XLR input. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah. But it's dynamic, so it doesn't require power. And what that means is that it doesn't pick up as far away. From it, it only kind of has a pickup area of about a foot and a half to two feet from it. Okay. Um, so you have to be four to six inches. Like now, it's not really pulling in sound. Right. It's, it's just not accepting what you're putting. See, like yeah, microphones don't listen, but it, this one listens less to things that are further away from it. It kind of works that way. Okay. Whereas a condenser mic requires power, so it gets a little bit of power, and it's much more detailed, and it also picks up much further distances. Okay. You know, and if you turn the gain up on it or you turn the level up, you could stand six feet away from a condenser mic and play a violin and it records it and it sounds like it's your ears are six feet away from it. Wow. Um, so it's it's much more powerful. And that's why the Blue Yeti, which is a condenser mic, causes problems for a lot of people because um, you know they're, they're not looking at the video of this recording, but they would have to be in a room like mine mm-hmm. where there are acoustic panels on the walls and, and carpet on the floor, or at least like drapes and bookcases around and carpet and a low ceiling. Like I have a, a panel cloud above my head that keeps things from bouncing back off the ceiling. You have to have that if you have a condenser mic. So that's okay. why... Like hands down, I whenever it. I tell people buy a mic, buy this mic or something similar to it, dynamic, you know, because people, some people have the Shure SM58, you know, like the traditional microphone that you see everyone have on stage. Yeah. Um, that's going to work better than anything else. So if you're a professional guest, you mm-hmm. definitely want to have that set up. All right, I'm getting a new mic. I'm just going to get the same mic. Yeah, just, for, just replace it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit about like the idea of the professional guest. Yeah. Um I've never referred to our clients as that, by the way. I love that. Yeah. Like the, if <laughs> yeah. you just gonna gonna guest, and there's really great examples of it. Like I think the best example I know is um Aaron Walker. I don't know if you've ever heard of Aaron or met him, but he did this thing. He, you know, he basically he wrote a book and to promote the book, he he went on every podcast in the world for like two years and he's he's known by everybody now he he goes by big a is his nickname he's at every podcast conference but he did like something like 400 podcast interviews in two years Mm -hmm. and out of those interviews grew like a whole other business for him now to the point where he does have a podcast that supports his other business um but i wanted i wanted to talk about that because i do tell like i tell my audience a lot one of the ways to grow your podcast is to go on other podcasts and, and borrow sure. an audience. And I wanted to hear um, from you, like, how has that affected your business? What mm-hmm. have you seen in terms of growth of your own podcast and your business from going on other podcasts? Yeah. So I actually started guesting on shows before I launched okay. my podcast. Um, and even in a previous business, I guested on shows and almost immediately saw an impact to my business Mm. Um, with, at that point I had like a free Facebook group. And so I was able to see people joining it. And I'm kind of crazy about making sure if I, if someone new comes to me, I want to find out where did you hear about me? Right. So I just really Mm -hmm. want to find out what's working in my business to connect with new people. And I kept seeing that the same podcast interview that I had done kept drawing people to me. So then when I transitioned over into the podcast pitching space, I I really launched my show because I felt if I'm in this space, I really want to be one of them. You know what I mean? I felt like I needed a behind the scenes. um, I mean, I definitely wanted to nurture my audience and create content, but I Mm -hmm. also wanted to more fully understand the podcast host because I'm such a big advocate of making sure that we show up to serve. So I, I mean, I probably guested for like nine months before I ever launched my show. Mm -hmm. And the beauty was that I was able to launch. I didn't have a big audience because I was a service provider. You know, I wasn't out there running ads or anything, but I was able to launch and have a pretty solid number of downloads from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then 
What I like to do is when I have episodes go live, I definitely track opt-ins because I do an opt-in, Danny. Mm -hmm. Um, So I like to track using pretty links. I use a WordPress plugin just to see what kind of traction I'm getting, like how many people really want to get to know me. Mm -hmm. But then I like to look, we use Libsyn as our um, hosting platform. I like to go in and see, well, did my show have any spikes that day that my guest episode went live? Mm-hmm. And I remember it was December, which was just like three months after I launched back in 2019. Okay. And I saw a big spike in listenership and the Go Pitch Yourself podcast. We only release episodes every other week. Mm-hmm. And I saw this spike in an off week that was very unusual. And it was because I had a guest episode go live and people then came back to my yeah. show. Yeah. And it's cool to see, okay, well, does that bump kind of... Um, almost like grow, you know, like, does it just, they pop over once and then they're gone. Well, if you're really strategic and getting in front of audiences that are very similar to yours, Mm -hmm. you can then see week after week, you know, it's just a slow roll of growth. So it's really been how I've grown my own podcast. I mean, I just ran ads for a launch, but it's not anything that I've put any other attention into. So I'm, I'm interested to know your take on when you think someone should be have their own podcast versus just be a guest and i'm not a good example of this because for instance i i've i've had a similar um i think a similar situation to you in that i've definitely gotten more business from going on other podcasts but I kind of have to have a podcast because yeah. uh, it's proof of concept. Like, can the podcast guy actually produce a podcast? So yes, I, I have to. Um, so when when do you think someone should have their own podcast versus just guest versus like, I mean, we know they should do both if they if they really want success. But is there a, is there a situation where you recommend one or the other? Yeah. So it's interesting what you said about how you've gotten the business from guesting. But I think part of that is because then if they hear you on someone else's show, they can pop back over and get a little more content. Like my show definitely warms people up in a way that I didn't have before. I mean, I literally was putting out zero content before my podcast. And so if they found me and loved me, it would be like, here's my services page. Would you like to pay me? So I think that's just a, an interesting piece of it is that there's almost this unquantifiable part. You're building up trust. Yeah. You're creating trust. For sure. Yeah. I, so I had a business coach who was amazing right around the time that I launched my show. Mm -hmm. And my plan for my show was to launch two shows a week. (laughs) And she said, okay, cool. (laughs) Yeah, right. That's the name of my game. And she said, well, and are you consistently pitching yourself to be on other people's podcasts? And I said, no, you know, and she said, well, I really want to challenge you until you have a plan and you're actually executing on consistently pitching yourself don't throw all of this time and effort into curating all of this content because you're not going to really have anyone to listen to it. And I think that's where a lot of podcast hosts walk into it thinking the podcast itself is going to start to just draw people in. And it, you know, it can, if you, you know, you rock it with SEO and, you know, you're publishing Mm -hmm. on social and stuff, but you have to have a way for new people to get their ears on your show. So, I mean, my answer to you is if you can do both, great. I feel like if you can't do both first, really get your feet wet with guesting. Mm -hmm. As long as you have something to refer those listeners back to, right? I mean, an opt-in or or, or something that provides additional value so they can get to know, like, and trust you. Um, And for the record, I mean, my goal when I launched, I ended up launching as an every other week show. Mm -hmm. And then my goal for 2020 was, okay, we're going to go to once a week. And I still wasn't able you know, to consistently pitch myself, I wasn't able to batch ahead enough to Mm -hmm. be able to turn that switch to every week publishing. And it's fine. I was on a, I forget, I was on an interview. Oh no, I was in a summit and the woman is a podcasting coach. And she was like, oh, you only publish every other week. Like we can do that. Or maybe it wasn't a summit, but I mean, I think people don't recognize that you get to decide what your show ends up 
looking like. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, you live and die with that for sure. But for me, that's been a really good fit. Very cool. Yeah. What about you? What are your thoughts on that? Like, I would agree. I, I think, you know, I talked to my audience about whenever you're thinking about growing your audience, you have to focus in, you have to focus at the current audience you have and give them value, uh, ask them what questions they have, ask them what they need help with, um, encourage them to share because they are your loyal audience. They are the people that trust you, but then you also have to focus outward and that's the yeah. you know standard promotion, but it's also get in other places where one, you have to think about, okay, who are the people that don't even know what a podcast is? How do you reach them? Okay, then the people that are listening to podcasts, how do you reach them? And that's usually go on other shows that they're already listening to. Yeah. Uh, you know, I tell people consistently, go into Apple Podcast app and scroll down on your podcast and see what other people are listening to that listen to your show. And if you aren't trying to get on those shows as a first step, like that's where you start. Don't just go to your friends. Don't just go where you think you should go, but check out what other people are listening to that listen yeah. to you. And, and if it's, you know, Gary V or Pat Flynn, okay, well maybe, you know, try something else first, a little <laughs> lower down on, on the, on the tree, but like, think about that to start to, um, you know, partner upwards with people that are maybe slightly bigger than you. Um, and then also then thinking about, um, the people that already listen to podcasts that also listen to you, how can you make their lives even better and encourage them to get the word out for you? Uh, yeah. that, that's kind of the approach that we take. Um, because yeah, if you don't have a lot of time, but you can hop on an interview once or twice a week, that's a great way to promote your book. That's a great way to, um, promote your business or be an expert or whatever. But if you really want to bring it together, you have to have that place to develop your own community. Yes. Um, I was talking with a client earlier today about, uh, this is a client that I've been advising for a while. Hey, you got to engage with your audience more. You really need to talk to your audience. Um, they're more, they're a professor, so they're more used to teaching. And so their podcast episodes have been really like an audio book. It's been like this great, oh, you could learn this whole system of things over their 40 episodes so far but they have not listened to the, hey, why don't you talk to your audience and see what else they need help with or what yeah. you might want to go back to because they didn't understand it or they need to go deeper into. And then they were talking about how, well, you know, we have this revenue stream of our book and we have this revenue stream of our courses and and those are um, not doing so well and this one's not doing so well. And I was like, I didn't know you had a book. Like, why have you never talked about your book on your podcast? You should start going through your book and every chapter and give your thoughts on the chapter and answer some yeah. questions and encourage people who've read the book. Like if you have an, uh, a tag on your email list of, of people who bought your book, go to them and say, hey, what questions do you have? I'm going to answer them on the podcast. And yeah. and then, you know, I didn't know you had courses. Like, why aren't you talking about your courses? Why aren't you encouraging people uh, to go sign up for them or um, use affiliate links to to the, like they're, they're one of these pe um, people who they have courses on LinkedIn learning or they have mm -hmm. on other services. Why aren't you talking like giving your affiliate links to give people to sign up for memberships there to create that as a revenue stream? Like you really need to think about your podcast as part of an ecosystem of yes. your marketing and they all work together because these are your core audience, your email list and your podcast. These are the people that spend a lot of time with you and trust you tell them about your stuff because they will be the ones that will drive that. Well, and I think what, especially when we talk about the value of hosting your own show, mm -hmm. for me, it has cut out me feeling pressure to show up in all these other different places. I mean, before I launched, I had a free Facebook group. And after I launched my show, I think it was only three months in, I thought, well, I'm shutting down the free Facebook group because I'm able to provide way more value to my audience on the podcast mm -hmm. than in any other place that I was showing up. And as you're talking about that client, I think it's just us as business owners, we create something, we put it out there, and then we move on to the next thing without really looking cohesively at, well, how can we pull all these things I've done? Stop. Mm -hmm 
doing new stuff and really just lean into those and kind of work, you know, the, the ecosystem. Yeah. So wild. Yeah, it's key. Yeah. So um, before we wrap up, I really yeah. want to hear about pitching yes. because that's something that I don't do. Um, I give a little bit of advice to my clients mm-hmm. on it, but I get occasionally the the pitches that are terrible that yeah. don't even have my name right and and stuff like that and it and it drives me crazy. Um so like what is what are one or two things that somebody could really do to make a podcast pitch to be a guest on someone else's show or to get a guest on their show? What makes them stand out? What are one or two sure. things people could do? I mean the the pre-work is that strategy that we've already talked about mm-hmm. is make sure you're pitching to someone who is serving an audience that's complementary to yours, right? I mean, people have pitched me to come on and talk about Facebook ads or all the just random tech, you know, um, mm-hmm. offerings that just don't make any sense for my people. So just make sure you're pitching people that have relevant audiences. And then within the pitch, the two things I would say you know, we always hear lead with value. And I think you might've even had a podcast about that. We hear that so often and people are like, well, what the hell does that mean? What does lead with value mean? It means in the podcasting space, come up with a topic that is super relevant to that audience. And it needs to be a specific topic. So often I get pitched and it'll be, well, Susie Q can talk on any of these five topics But then the onus is on me as the host to decide which is the best fit. And often they're all so far out in left field. So for me, it's super important that you, you're, you own your expertise. Like, you know what you can talk about and you can look at a podcast and see typically who they speak to and what they speak about, and then pick that piece of your expertise and offer that up as a conversation starter. Um, So that's kind of a logistics piece of it. But then the other is that whole tone of the email. Some of it has to do with you don't need to share, you know, a three paragraph bio, really two sentences about who you are and a couple of credibility metrics typically cover it as long as the topic is interesting. So make sure when you're communicating with a host, I one time Carol Cox said, I love your pitches because you always give me an out. Like, mm-hmm. it's just, you're not emailing with this um, positioning of you would be crazy not to say yes to having me as a guest on your show. But hey, I thought of a topic that might be a really good fit for your audience because mm-hmm. I recognize that they are X, Y, Z. I'd love to get to know, I'd love to know your thoughts on it, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just the wording of this might be a good fit. It might not be, and that's okay. We can still be you know, acquaintances or whatever, if you say no, like this relationship doesn't end with you saying no. And I feel like that's where a lot of the pitches you and I get go terribly wrong. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, they're, they're totally just like cold emails that have no clue. And Mm -mm. uh, like I said, the ones that they don't even have my name, right. You know, cause I can tell they're on the wrong line of their spreadsheet that they're going down or whatever. Uh Um, just giving people I, I like it too when when a pitch does my work for me. Yes. <laughs> you know, tells me what I should ask the person and and what their answers might be. Um so oh, that I can okay. think about, oh, well, rather than coming up with all the questions, I can come up with the follow-up questions because I mm-hmm. can see this topic really fits with how I can serve my audience. So let me get deeper into that by asking a follow-up question here. It yeah, sounds so we, more organic. We do that with bullet points. So we'll okay. introduce, this might be a really great conversation for your listeners. Mm-hmm. A chat about this could include any of the following talking points. And then yeah. when the host says, okay, cool, it's a yes. Can you send me over some questions? We just yeah. turn those bullet points into questions. Um, but yeah, it's it's this idea of painting a picture, right? So that mm-hmm. So you don't have to do the work. You can literally read that pitch and know immediately whether it's a yes or a no. It's not something you have to sit on and think on. All of the links that you might want to check out are available mm-hmm. to you. We also include a one sheet, but yeah. we only started doing that like a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, yeah. So even before then, your pitches were very crafted oh, to yeah. that that person. Yeah. That's... But we use a template. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing is we we don't forsake efficiency 
you know, like we don't give up efficiency in order to be personable. Gotcha. We have a really extensive template and we, okay. but we're also targeted. That's the beauty of us not pitching every podcast under the sun is we know the niches that we're pitching for our clients. Yeah. And so we have five ish core topics and they don't shift that much, you yeah. know? So this was, this was really helpful. Yeah. Um, I like having these types of conversations and we, you know, we sort of talked about it. Like we decided to do a conversation where we could help both of our audiences at the same time and, and not have to do two entirely separate interviews. Um, but you know, we've, we've hinted at it <laughs> so far. So where can people find you? Like, where should they go to download something or, or find you, Angie? Yeah. So you can definitely listen to my podcast to go pitch yourself podcast. It's everywhere that you would look, be looking for a podcast. I'm somewhat active on Instagram at Angie underscore true blood. I mean, we definitely put out episodes. We share content on there. Um, and I am the one I interact mainly in the DMS on Instagram. It's so crazy. Cool. Um, and then if folks want to get a better sense of sort of how we serve our people, I do have an opt-in available. Um, <laughs> they can get that at my website, angietrueblood.com and we'll do a backslash Danny so that okay. they can grab it and, um, check it out. Cool. Yeah. And, and for I, me, I would, yes, you, you can find me, um, uh, I've changed my podcast name several times. So the easiest way to find my podcast is just to search my name, Danny Osmond. Okay. And on all the socials at Danny Osmond. Um, but like I was joking with you with you earlier, um, do as I say, don't do as I do, because you'll see political posts from me as well as like me talking about collecting watches and then also podcasting on my Instagram. Um, and then if you want to learn stuff from me, just go to dannyosmond.com. That's where my podcast is. That's where my blog is. That's where you can find out about my podcast launch intensives. That's where you can find out about the mentor mind that I run for podcasters to help the ones who've gotten started continue to grow and, and learn from each other. I love it. Um, I, w I wanted to ask you really quick though. We didn't really sure. talk about interview swaps. Do we have like three minutes just yeah. to share? Totally. Yeah. I thought this was interesting and, you know, we pitch clients and often they have a show of their own. And so sometimes mm -hmm. the host we're pitching to will say, can we do an interview swap? And a lot of times they're open to it if it makes sense, but they'll do two separate interviews. Yeah. But what we're doing is one conversation that we're going to place on each of our shows. Yeah. To save time. <laughs> yeah. Well, still, yeah, but, I, um, yeah, like, I started to try and do that with people I know to save people's time. Cause what, what I'd seen clients do a lot is they get in that bind of, oh gosh, I don't have anything for this week's show. Ooh, but I have this podcast episode that I did. Well, So-and-so interviewed me two months ago. Hey, let me email them real quick and see if I can just share that interview because it was interesting. <clears throat> and they started to do that. And, and I was like, well, you know, that's kind of really obvious that you just wanted to share something that you didn't have to create. <laughs> so I was like, well, why not make it more organic that like you actually look like you have a relationship with this person you're talking to. And it wasn't just someone you pitched and they said, yeah, sure. Come on my show. Yeah. And oh yeah, sure. You can share this episode on your feed as well. That it sounded like, okay, they like each other. They know a little bit about each other <clears throat> because to me, that's, why podcasts work, right? The relationship yeah. that the listener has with the host. And if it sounds like the host actually likes and understands and knows the person a little bit, then it, it's more effective. And and rather than doing an interview swap where it's like, oh, okay, so-and-so is the host and the guest and so-and-so is the host and the guest, yeah. that's cool. But if you can make it even more organic, then the audience is like, yeah. And that works even better than just the pre-show chat where you try to develop some rapport with one another <laughs> you maybe you've actually had a call i i've um i've even seen some podcasters where even if they get pitched and even if they're booking someone as a guest they like to have a pre-show call <clears throat> where they'll do yeah. like a half an hour two weeks before the actual interview because they really want to feel like when they come back on the show they actually knew the person yeah for sure. and it, and it felt better no, I like it. I feel like if we would have done it separately, 
it's sort of like, okay, well, when I'm interviewing Danny, it's the Danny show. And that's yeah. not true, but right. it's definitely, like you said, more organic and more back and forth. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I want to start playing around with that for our clients too. I like it. Yeah. More, more podcast listeners like that than the, than the program. It, to me, it's like, it's the same as if you script your episode, it just found, it feels more, um, stiff yeah. than, you know, if they, if they know it's going to be interview back and forth, back and forth, question, answer, question, answer. Okay. That's just another interview. But if it's like, whoa, I feel like I got to sit down in the same room with Angie and Danny and they were just talking about the stuff back and forth. Yeah. Um, that feels like an experience. Yeah. And people sure. want experiences, especially with the way the last year has gone. <laughs> people want experiences. They want to feel like they're part of something. Oh, yeah. Um, more so than just being taught by the professor or by yeah. whatever. <clears throat> I, love it. I love it. All right. This is perfect. I can't wait to, yeah. to share it. Hey folks, I wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit about a tool that I use every month. It's called Text Expander, and I, I, I get a monthly email from them where they report on how much time I have saved by using Text Expander. And I just love getting this because I'm looking at last month, and I saved close to an hour and 17 minutes using Text Expander. If you're if you're not familiar with it, Text Expander basically allows you to insert uh, snippets of text in any app from a library of content that you have created. So I have simple things like my email address and my phone number and my home address, all the way to email templates that I've created or answers to questions that I answer all the time. I can easily shoot these snippets into any app, any email, any document that I'm creating, and it saves a ton of time. Um, I would love for you to check them out. If you are interested in using Text Expander, just go to dannyosmond.com slash Text Expander for more information. 